Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome back to the 3D Software Rendering Tutorial Series. Last time, we got a true general purpose transformation system working. So that means we can take points or triangles, and we can easily draw them in perspective, make them spin around, make them move around, make them scale up and down, do whatever transformation we want. And that is awesome. But, at the same time, we've just about reached the limit of interesting things we can do with solid color triangles. So at this point, it would make sense to move on to some more interesting things we can do with triangles. Like, say, maybe drawing a texture on the triangle. Or maybe have lighting and shading going on. But, well, there's a problem. If we're going to do all that stuff, we absolutely can do it right now, but it's probably not going to work like we expect. We're going to need to improve the quality of our triangle rasterizer for things to really work out nicely. Because if we tried doing that sort of thing right now, we'd run into lots of really subtle issues. Like if we tried doing texture mapping, we'd run into an issue called hairy textures, where the textures would sort of have notches and pimples in them, and it would look really weird and wrong, even if the texture mapper itself was perfectly implemented. And if you try drawing te te er, not textures, if you try drawing triangles that are perfectly adjacent to each other, we'd have drop pixels, we have pixels overlapping each other, and that's not what we want. We have all sorts of weird speckling artifacts at the scene. And that's just not what we're going for. So if we really want to move on to more advanced, more interesting types of rasterization, it's really, really important to just take a step back now and make sure we're really doing things properly. And that brings us to the topic of today's video, fill conventions. So what is a fill convention? All a fill convention is trying to do is make sure that no matter what shape you're drawing, it can be big, it can be small, it can be fat, it can be skinny. It doesn't even have to be a triangle. It can be a more advanced beige surface or something. Whatever. Just whatever shape you're drawing. If a pixel's center is inside that shape, it is lit up. Otherwise, it is not. Simple as that. And that's all a fill convention is trying to do. Sounds simple enough, right? I mean, I have this triangle here, as you see, and every pixel whose center is inside the triangle, it's lit up. Every pixel whose center is not inside the triangle, isn't lit up. And it sounds easy, but especially when you get into more advanced rasterization techniques, there can be a lot of subtleties to this, and they can be notoriously difficult to handle properly. And also, some of the math is a little bit counterintuitive, but the goal at the end of the day is very simple. If the pixel center is inside the shape, it's drawn. Otherwise, it isn't. So, what I'm going to try to do here is give you an intuitive understanding of how the math works for our triangle here. And, if you're interested in a more in-depth, rigorous explanation of where all the math comes from, what's the algebra to derive it, whatever. I will link you to Chris Hecker's article on perspective texture mapping, because in there he goes through a very nice segment where he does where he talks about a lot of the subtleties and details of the math that goes into getting a proper fill convention. But I'm just going to try and give you an intuitive understanding. So want more in-depth stuff? Look there. But anyways. So, here's how this works. I'm just going to look at the x-axis for simplicity, but the same rules and techniques I'm going to talk about also apply on the y-axis. So, let's just look at the x-axis. How do I determine what the first pixel that is inside the shape is on a given scan line? So let's look at line 3, for instance. Now, I do know the values of these two vertices. I can determine what this point is, the point I have my cursor in, which is basically the point on the edge that is perfectly aligned with 
that scan lines pixel centers, and that can be useful. In this case, that's probably about like 0 0.1 or something, but yeah. So you can determine that, and then you do not want to round or truncate this. I know that might seem a little counterintuitive, like because the intuitive thing you want to do when you're going from floating point to integer is round or truncate, but you don't. What you actually want to do is you want to take the ceiling of this. Why? Because if I rounded this or truncated it, I'd get zero. And as you see, pixel zero, not inside the triangle. The first pixel that is inside the triangle is the ceiling of that, which is pixel one. So yeah, that's the real tricky part about it. The math is not hard, it's just the ceiling function, but the reason why it's the ceiling function can be a bit tricky. So yeah, and same logic applies for all the different scan lines. For scan line one, you want to find what the point along the edge that is aligned with scan line one, so this point right here where I have my cursor, and that's probably about a little over 0 0.9. And again, if you try truncating it, that's going to give you pixel zero, not what you want. What you want is the ceiling. So the ceiling of that gets you pixel one, exactly what you want. Now for the end of the scan line, you might think, well, that's not going to work. If I go to scan line one again, find the, the point of this edge that's aligned to the pixel center, that's right here, probably about 2.2 or something. And if you take the ceiling of that, that gets you pixel three. Pixel three, not inside the triangle. So the ceiling must be totally wrong, right? No. Because you've got to remember how are we using the scan line. Let's say we are rasterizing from one to three. How is that at work in our scan line thing? Well, we're using less than, not less than or equal to. So we start at one, we draw one, we go to two, we draw two, we go to three, but three is the end, so we just end without drawing it. So yeah, you gotta be careful because the last pixel is not inclusive, it's not drawn. So in fact, the ceiling is still correct. So there. So yes, it is a ceiling function, it's a ceiling function in all cases, that can be a little counterintuitive, but there it is. And something to mention is that if you are using the ceiling function, this gets you something called a top left fill convention. And that means that if a pixel center happens to la land directly on the edge, if this edge happens to perfectly intersect pixel 1, 1, for instance, well, is inside or outside the triangle? It depends. If it's a top or left edge, then it's considered inside the triangle. But if it's a bottom or right edge, it's considered outside the triangle. And the reason this is important, if I'm drawing a triangle that's directly next to it, let's say I take these vertices, draw another triangle, you don't want to draw the same pixel twice, and you especially don't want to skip over drawing the pixel. So for certain edges, you, you draw the pixel, for certain edges you don't. And again, that's all in the ceiling function. Because, well, what's the ceiling of one? It's one, so there. But on the other hand, if it's a right edge, if this happens to go perfectly through pixel two, for instance, well, what's the ceiling of two? It's still two. And since that's the end of the scan line, that won't get lit up. So yeah. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you as to how it works and why it's the ceiling function. So there. So let's go into the scan convert line function in render context, and let's implement this. On the most basic level, we really do just need to do math.seal in, instead of just directly casting it to an integer. And that'll do most of the work for us. However, there's still a few subtleties we're going to need to deal with. First off, we're going to want to keep our values as floating point values as long as we possibly can. So, for instance, our y dist and x dist, we're going to want to change this, we're going to want to change these to floats, because we don't need to have these as integers just yet. We're going to want to keep these as, again, like I said, floating point values as long as I can. So, instead of y end minus y start, we're going to do max y vert dot get y minus, if I can select it properly, min y vert dot get, get y. And same sort of thing for x, instead of x end minus x start, max y vert dot get x minus min y vert dot get x. So there. 
This is just keeping everything as floating point as long as we can. So this way, when our faux conventions are applied, they're using the most accurate information, well, they reasonably can. So there. So that's good. X step, all floating point now, so that's good. Current X. This is going to be a bit tricky. And the reason it's going to be a bit tricky is because we're going to have to combine a little bit of this stuff that's been converted to integers with our fill convention and some stuff that's still floating point. So let me put it this way. Let's say this is, this is my max wyvert, where my cursor is. So yeah, this, this right here, max wyvert. If I convert the X location, and then I move to the first scan line, well, you notice, if I just move down on Y, my cursor is no longer along the edge. So we're going to have to adjust for that. So to do this, what we're going to need is we're going to need a Y pre-step. What this is going to equal is essentially this distance right here, the distance between the real-valued Y coordinate and the first scan line. And this is very easy to get. Our first scan line is the y start minus our, well, the original value, which is minyvert.get y. So there you go. That's a pre step. And now our x step, this is how much our x value increases for every increase in the y value. So all we have to do is say x start, actually not x start, we want to keep this as minyvert.getx, just keep it as floating point as we can, because we're not casting such an integer just yet, and we're going to add y prestep times x step. So this will take into account this distance, we'll move it back the appropriate x amount for that y distance. And there, so our current x is appropriate now. Yeah, you just got to be careful about that, that's really the trickiest part of this. And now finally, where we're doing here, where we're actually saying, yes, this is an integer value now, we're going to apply our fill convention. So math.seal current x. And there. And now there's only one more place where we're going to have to do something like this. And that is right here, fill shape. We need to use math.seal of the get y's because, well, we're using integer values here. And yeah, that should be all we need to do. So if I build and run, then. It looks exactly the same. Yeah, fill convention really, or fill conventions really aren't one of those visual things. They're really one of those just subtle details that you have to take into account because otherwise things later on will have lots of really subtle issues that'll be very hard to track down. So by doing things right now, we're making our lives a lot easier down the road. So yeah, and that's pretty much it for fill conventions, at least for now. But you know, that scan buffer we have, that sure takes up a hunk of memory. Will that withstand the test to scalability, or will we run into a few varying issues? Find out next time on the 3D Software Rendering Tutorial Series. Hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and I'll see you next time.